The Monerotopia Price Report segment is sponsored by Local Monero. Avoid using KYC exchanges. Buy and sell Monero directly for fiat, peer to peer. Just before okay, so before you get going, before you go, I'm just want to say I'm seeing like we were at over seventy, we're at like seventy five people and just tons of comments today. This this is uh, th- things things are alive and well here in Monerotopia land, guys. So this this is this is a good sign, good sign. It's all it's all working as planned. The the Streisand effect is taking effect, I'd say. But go ahead, body, take take it away. Cool. Well, thanks for mentioning the YouTube comments. I put my YouTube here up on my top screen, so hopefully I can. If you guys have questions, shout them out. Um, you know, uh, hopefully I can get to them here. Um, okay, so yeah, starting with uh, starting with Monero USD, this uh, this dotted line right here, that vertical line, that was the moment that Binance published that they were going to delist Monero. That was 7 a.m. UTC. Um, so uh, let's see. I think that's two two a.m. Um, Eastern time. And we're looking at the two minute chart. Um, I had a, I had like a five second chart. Is it? Let me find my five second chart if I can find it. All right. I guess I can't find it. Um, let me just do this. I was just looking at it too. I must, I must have had it on a different screen, but I don't want to have to search for it. All right. So here's the five second chart. We will Alt G to February 6th at 7 a.m. Okay. So obviously this, um, where the drop started, let's see, that's 10 seconds. All right, we'll just drop a little vertical line there. So one thing that you're gonna see here is that within the first like 20 seconds, Monero on Kraken was down 5% already or almost 5% within 20 seconds. So like obviously people knew about this, obviously um, you know, there were some kind of insiders that knew about this and then they immediately started selling. Now, is it possible and even likely that you have AI bots scraping sites like Binance and um, and other websites looking for key information, delistings, coin listings, stuff like that, and then taking positions on that. Sure, sure, probably. But I want to know where exactly are they taking those positions on Monero? Um, it's I think Agora Desk offers uh, offers leverage, and then Kraken I believe also offers leverage. So there's really no other place for them to do that. So okay, was this was this AI bots that detected? you know, a Monero news story and said, oh, okay, they're delisting Monero from Binance. This is a key story we've been waiting for. Um, or was it the inside cabal that knew this was going to happen and then immediately started selling, you know, within seconds of publishing? Probably a little bit of both. Um, it's it's hard for me to believe that uh, that these guys wouldn't have used that knowledge to their benefit. So, um, yeah, I thought that was interesting. If we go down to, um, to the one minute chart, oh man, we already lost it. Uh, let's go to the other one. My charts have been been slow today. Like like they're, I'll tell it to maximize or to minimize, and it'll take a second. And then plus we're also on the stream, so that's going to induce some delay. So please be patient if the charts are being weird. Um, okay, but anyways, in the first two minutes of delisting, we were already down eight and a half percent. Actually, including the wick, that'd be about nine percent. So um, yeah, I mean, very very interesting. Um, when uh, you know, when I got wind of the news, I said, "All right, this is this is the opportunity to buy some Monero," um, and uh, kind of canceled all my plans that day and and just said, "Okay, I'm gonna stare at the charts here and try and find the amazing, most ideal, opportune entry into uh, you know to get some Monero." Mostly just for fun. I haven't traded one minute charts or anything like that for a long time. Um, as Tuck said, it's like it's very um, it's nerve wracking. It's time consuming. Um, it's I'd really rather be doing other things with my time. Um, which is one another reason kind of that I've moved towards a little bit more towards long-term trading um, as opposed to trying to like do all the short-term stuff. But I thought, hey, you know, here's an opportunity. This could be interesting. Let's see if I can, um, you know, let's see if I can get a good entry price. And what's funny is that um, $100 was the entry price. And it's like, that's kind of, we're looking at the the midwit, uh, we're looking at the IQ curve meme here, right? Where, you know, the the low low intelligence guy is like, uh, oh, hundred dollars that's, that's 100. It's even, it has, it has two zeros. Right. And then and then like at the high end, you're like, well, a hundred dollars is like a very um natural point. Plus there's a whole bunch of other confluence points there. Um so before we really take a look at the one minute charts, let's um let's zoom out here really quick so that we can we can see a little bit better uh what's going on with the price just to get our bearings. So you'll notice here um at the bottom, I've got this kind of trend line drawn. I've had um or sorry, not trend line, we've had uh the moving average, right? So this white line here that I just selected, that's that's if you take the close price of every single candle for the entire history of the XMR USD price on Kraken. 
And that's the moving average of the entire chart, right? That's not the 100 day. It's not the 1,000 day. It's like literally however many days Monero has been trading on Kraken, um, which I guess I could tell you right here. Looks like looks like about 3,555 days um, Monero has been trading on Kraken. So um, give or take a few, That's that'll, that'll be like slightly off. But anyways, um, yeah, so that's like, that's the long, like the full moving average, like the lifetime moving average of, of Monero price. And you'll notice it sits right here at $101, right? So that was kind of nice. Um, we also had this kind of trend line here that had been drawn for quite a while um, from the top. So that was another good little confluence there, right at $99. Uh, and then $100, you know, just being a nice round number is that, okay, that's like, that's a very prominent place to be looking for, um, for a bottom to be happening uh, on the US dollar price. The other thing too, that's, um, and it's a minor point, but these, um, these red lines down here, these are, they're not standard deviations, but they're derivations of standard deviations. Um, these red lines are often like good places for swing price action to happen, um, especially when you come at it from the top side. So um, I was looking at that as like the very first place that price might hit. And then kind of these lower lines down here um, between 83 and 72. But I, I didn't really think that we would get that low. It, it seemed it seemed like too much panic. And I just know there's too many people that like to buy the dip like that. So um, yeah, $100 was like kind of always a, a very prominent spot in my mind um, to be looking at. And um, but you don't want to like you, you want to corroborate as many things as you can and say, OK, does does the full picture tell the same story? So the other thing I was doing was looking at um, XMR BTC and XMR versus ETH. And um, yeah, this was a really interesting chart as well, because as we hit $100, we also touched this um, this lower stand standard deviation line. So uh, again, um, standard deviation, this, this um, solid orange line right here being the lower standard deviation for every single candle of this chart. Um, pro tip for you guys out there that want the full chart history, you can't look up XMR ETH. Like if you type in Binance, colon XMR ETH, or you just type in XMR, XMR ETH, you're not going to get the full price history because Binance, Kraken, and these other exchanges, they weren't trading the XMR ETH pair back in those days. So if you want to understand the full history of the relative price between two assets, um, especially crypto assets, what you need to do is type in the exchange that you want to use and the US dollar price, and then the same exchange, and then the other price, right? The Ethereum US dollar price because there's two full chart histories for these things right here. So you can divide a longer history of those two relative valuations to each other, even though the pair didn't exist at the time. So um, that's probably that's probably like a non-nefarious reason why Bitcoin maximalists always post the wrong fucking chart for XMR BTC, because they're just looking at how long that trading pair has existed and not how long both assets have existed. So anyways, um, yeah, this lower standard deviation here for the lifetime of um, this particular chart, or at least this particular data, um, when we tagged that, that was another like good corroborating signal. Um, and it happened right around hundred dollars as well. Um, so yeah, let's go back to, um, to the shorter timeframes. And, um, that, by the way, <laughs> this is not necessarily recommended, right? I'm not necessarily, I'm not trying to like encourage you guys to trade on the short timeframes. This is just the kind of shit I'm looking at, especially when, um, like a violent event happens like this. So, um, uh, anyways, um, let's take a look at the volume now. So that was another thing that I wanted to see corroborated. This moment right here with this white dotted line, um, right there is when the, again, that's 7 a.m. Um, UTC. And so that's when the volume shot up because selling was happening. So um, uh, let's see. I think I just caught wind of uh, Anon Mon. We'll, we'll talk about price astrology, bro. You don't understand statistics and you really need to understand statistics because I can prove to you that this shit works. So anyways, we'll talk a little bit more about that later. Um, so anyways, uh, the <laughs> but I, I just want to say we're, we're up to like 80 live viewers. I think we're, we're breaking records here, guys. Uh, like and share. Let's see if we can hit 100, 100 live viewers. Go ahead, man. Nice. So this, uh, this white line right here, that's the moving average. That's a 20 period moving average of the two minute candles on volume. And again, we're looking at Kraken. So one thing I wanted to see was um, originally I was telling myself I want to see volume kind of drop off as we go into the bottom. Um, but instead, what we saw was volume kind of pumped up. And that happened simultaneously with hitting these statistical levels. And I said, OK, um, we like, you know, we basically saw volume kind of flat here, peaking out flat. And then it jumped up here. I said, OK, that's probably like the final that's likely a final sell volume area. And again, that happened concurrently as we uh, as we hit one hundred dollars. So I said that was kind of when I smashed the smell, uh, the sell, the, the buy button. Um, I guess I was doing that with uh, with Tux here, both of us doing it at the same time. But yeah, I mean, I caught a pretty good entry, right? I caught I caught an entry right in this area, um, which was which was pretty sweet. 
Um, so that doesn't always happen. You don't always nail it like that, but, um, there was just so many confluence points. It was just, it was really easy to smash the buy button there at a hundred. And if for no other reason, it's a hundred dollars, it's a hundred dollars and it's the moving average for the lifetime of the chart. Cool. Yeah. So that was um, me. I was the der her a hundred dollars just because it's, it's cool. Uh, bro, I honestly thought it was going to go lower bottom. though. Um, because it seemed like it was hitting the price. Like I was like a hundred might be a price floor. It was hitting so quickly. I was just watching it happen. It was hitting that so quickly. And then it even went under just a little bit, a couple times, but it ended up being a price floor. So it didn't really go lower than that. Yeah. You can even see in like the wick action here, the way this, um, like wick down, wick down, wick down, wick down and wick down. Like that's, that's kind of a very common bottoming pattern I've seen. And I've seen it on long-term charts as well. I've seen that happen on hour charts on day charts. Um, but yeah, uh, I, I guess we made the bottom, bro. You and me, probably, probably just us alone. I'm pretty sure. No, I'm kidding. I don't yeah, have that liquidity. <laughs> but honestly, like, oh, the other thing I was looking at too is the um, was the order book. Um, so we've seen some price, some down price action um, today, uh, as of like the past 12 hours. But the order book right now is um, is sitting fat towards the buy side. Um, that doesn't mean price can't go down. You could have like big liquidity sellers. Or you could have um, like psychology, market psychology, where people are just smashing the sell button into this uh, into this order book. But um, that was kind of another change that happened in real time. The order book went from being heavy on the sell side uh, to being heavy on the buy side, right around that hundred dollar point. So, um, yeah, all of those things were like useful things to um, to be looking at. Um, oh, here's another one that I was also looking at um, that I thought would be useful. So um, uh, after they, you know, after the selling started happening predictably the price on Binance and all of their associated scumbag exchanges was also moving towards the downside. And um, I said to myself, okay, what I want to see is, uh, is this turnaround and I want to see them start moving back to the upside. Right. And, and it's mostly like, it's not so much that I'm looking at like the fundamental, what's the, what's the mechanism behind this and, and, and why is this true? It's more like, I want to see a change in the prevailing conditions that we saw on the way down if we're bottoming, I want to see those conditions change. Um, and so they had already kind of changed, right? We'd already started to see things go towards the upside as we were bottoming here. So right around this area, um, we had already seen uh, the price divergences started starting to move towards the upside. So in other words, Kraken's price was the highest. All of these guys were lower and they had diverged down Binance uh, almost minus 4% uh, at one time here. So um, yeah, just seeing all those things together, I said, all right, that's probably... That's probably a good buy point. I don't normally short-term trade, but I had been looking to refill my um, my spendable Monero bags, so um, that worked out pretty good. Uh, and maybe then the last thing we can look at is these uh, is these the Z scores, Z scores. Um, yeah, so basically um, we had been trending up uh, for quite a while on the Z scores, and this happens. Um, you can trend up for a very long time on Z scores before the price actually um, uh, moves back to the upside, and this is basically like RSI. Um, except for it's like a statistically more statistically appropriate metric to look at. RSI is like somewhat kind of um, arbitrary, um, although it's sort of it basically paints a similar picture as Z-scores. I just like Z-scores because it's like it's a correct statistical metric. Anyways, um, so you'll notice that uh, effectively like things were already moving towards the upside um, on the Z-scores. Basically, we were already trending um, back towards zero. We'd already the momentum was already shifting um, as we came into that low. So for all of those reasons, I thought, all right, time to buy. Um, I was kind of thinking we might, there was a chance we might come back down one more time. Um, and I kind of had another stack that I was ready to buy with. Um, but I said, well, uh, we never got, we never got back down there. So I sadly didn't buy as much as I really wanted to, but, um, I did buy like at least half of what I wanted. So, um, enough to refill what I, what I'd spent for the past few months, a little more actually. So, um, yeah, that's, um, I thought that, I thought it was all pretty cool. I thought that was fun. Fun little game to play. I mean, even if you um, average like anywhere below 120, that's still pretty good. Yeah, like I mean, even buying here is still is still probably opportunity. Like I said, I really want to see what happens to price after Binance is done, right? After it's off their exchange and after they uh, you know, they don't have anything else to do with Monero and they can't like fuck with the price that way. Um, I'm curious too what these other exchanges do. I think Qcoin is like the direction they're moving. I Maybe I've got that wrong, but I'm pretty sure like Qcoin has been popping out in my mind um, more consistently. Um, and there's a couple new exchanges on the scene as well. So probably they're just going to, you know, Binance is done. So they're probably just going to rotate this and like their their schemes. They're probably going to rotate it into other exchanges and something else will, will become the big exchange. There's definitely a demand out there for, um, I don't know, there's a demand for accountless um, non-KYC exchanges and 
because of that demand, um, you know, those guys are going to continue to probably survive and even thrive, especially in a bull market when people want to trade shit coins and um, and now, they, and a lot of these uh, these non KYC like instant exchanges, I think we're relying though on Binance, right, for their liquidity and. I mean, I, I don't know. I, I thought I, I thought I heard that, or I could assume that, right? That some of these um, yeah, instant exchanges actually just kind of live off of Binance. I remember um, even some of the people you've interviewed. Yeah, it definitely seemed like uh, they depend on Binance for that liquidity. So. Um, I'm pretty curious what happens to the instant swap exchanges. Um, yeah. I, I bet you they they create deals, they find, they source liquidity from other exchanges. Um, but hopefully, hopefully we start to see more decentralized exchange um, pick up, more local Monero, more Sarai, uh, more atomic swaps. Um, but I guess we'll just have to wait and see, right? So I think someone, let's talk about long-term levels here. Um, Right now, let's go to a shorter time frame, actually. Yeah, so right now we're basically below the long-term um, standard deviation, right? Like that right there would be the line. Um, normally on this kind of price action, you would say that getting back up to here and then getting above, above that is going to be difficult. Um, these are statistical levels, and when you have fundamentally large events, they don't necessarily, um, especially the long-term levels, they don't necessarily tell you much. Um, because fundamental events and market psychology and severe kinds of events can completely overshadow your sort of steady state statistical um, workings. And uh, this is kind of another place where it's like um, the people that that call this chart astrology don't understand like it's a tool. Statistics are a tool. They're a mathematical tool that you can I mean, <laughs> they're based on they're based on like 100 years, more than 100 years of um, just like understanding how to do this kind of math, right? How to do statistical probabilities, et cetera. But they're not infallible. Like they're not a magic crystal ball that are going to tell you exactly what the price does. They're not going to tell you that that CZ or Binance is about to delist Monero. And like, they can't tell you those kinds of things. So they're useful, especially in steady state times um, where things are mostly just chugging along. They give you, generally they give you um, psychological levels because humans are pretty good at like intuiting statistics. Um, in fact, they, they, they do these experiments where um, they'll play, they'll like put people into like a little game and they're winning a little bit of money or they're losing a little bit of money. And if they stack the decks slightly in your favor, within like a very short period of time, your brain just quickly understands that it's um, that it's winning and that it has a good chance to win. And like it produces all of those physiological responses. And if you stack the decks slightly against them, your brain very quickly intuits that the deck is stacked against you and you start to get all of those kind of nervous ticks going on. So Humans have a pretty good intuition for statistics, especially in aggregate. So in an aggregate sense, that's what these lines that we're looking at are. This, is, this isn't astrology. They're just statistical levels. And they kind of give you a picture of what the general market thinks about price and about like when price trends to certain areas, they tell you like, okay, statistically speaking, you're in trend, you're out of trend, you're this far out of trend. Uh, and it gives you an idea of what the market might be thinking, right? So it's it's this is not just like tea leaves astrology. This is helping you to understand what people's psychology is going to be about about an asset. Um, the other thing too is that after having done that Bitcoin regression analysis, both for the top side and the bottom side of price, right? We're talking about the upper boundary and the lower boundary, and maybe a picture's worth a thousand words here. Um, like I can prove to you that this model is better than any other model out there. Uh, let's remove some of this stuff. Okay. Yeah, I can I can statistically prove to you that this model was derived using proper application of regression analysis methodology, which seeks regression analysis seeks to um, to define a best fit line for a series of points. Right. Say, okay, this line is the line, the mathematical equation that satisfies all of the points on the chart as best as you possibly can. And if you try to produce a different line, you're going to get statistically less valid results, right? You're going to have a less significant result, um, whether that's your um, whether that's your R squared or your adjusted R squared or your um, um, your residual standard error, et cetera. These are like very clear mathematical concepts that have been developed for good reason. Um, and Bitcoin has very closely obeyed um, the upper and lower regression analysis, like. I made this, especially the upper regression. I made this in January of 2021, and then we in April of uh, April of 2021, we came within one percent of touching this line right here. So, it's like this wasn't an accident. 
that that things happen like that. Like this this line was modeling the upper the blue line here is modeling the upper boundary of Bitcoin price. If you had used the same methodology to try and call 2017 the top of that before, like again doing the analysis before the top was in, you would have been within five percent of that top. So it's like this is this is like this is not an accident. This is not astrology, right? Like. This is not just random bullshit. Like this is actually modeling something in a way. The, there are real economic reasons why price, I, I'm assuming there are probably very real economic processes and reasons why price on Bitcoin couldn't get any higher. Um, and that's probably all this line is, is sort of modeling. Like, hey, here's here's that line. Here's the maximum possible fraud price of Bitcoin. Um, and then we've kind of got the lower boundary price as well, right? Um, which is actually a different equation. And that was like the key insight that made this chart viable was to realize that the top equation was different from the bottom equation and then validly filter out the top data in a way that didn't um, distort your lower data. So um, we came within, I believe it was 9%, maybe it was 8% of um, this lower boundary here. It's very possible that um, if we get some kind of washout in the future, we might actually fully touch this lower boundary. So um, Anonmon, I really, man, come on to the show, talk to me about this. Maybe I'm like, maybe I misunderstand your position. You're saying that's a straw man. Maybe I don't understand what it is you're saying. I, I hear you say this often that we're doing chart astrology here. Um, Look, man, if nothing else, a lot of people believe it. And so it's a self-fulfilling prophecy, a lot of this TA. Um, so it's useful, but it, you can't just like, you can't just look at tea leaves and be like, okay, I'm going to judge my future on tea leaves. You might draw a couple tarot cards and like, if you're spiritual, but you're not just going to like only live by drawing a tarot card every time you're going to make a decision. Like, it's just one of the things you can look at. So, uh, I mean, I hope that, I hope that makes some kind of sense to at least some people out there. But again, I, um, <laughs> I encourage you to come on today and, and chat this out with me because, um, Maybe we can come to some kind of accord or agreement, or maybe you can enlighten me. Maybe I'm just totally out to lunch and you can you can show me why. Let's hash it out live. Doug can moderate. Word. Yeah, he should just jump up. Jump up today. Viewers on stage. By the way, I see yeah. uh, Hunter Housen is asking you for doing a dev, dev segment. Yeah, man, you, you're, you're, you're the one doing it. So uh, <laughs> come on <laughs> up. Um, yeah, so we'll, be, we'll do dev segment uh, right after this. All right, I'll ahead, fly buddy. through the the macro here, and then I'll and then I'll you know I'll shut my mouth. Okay, Dixie, Dixie is doing kind of what we thought it would do. We think it's going to meander on up to these uh, upper standard deviation levels here, but overall, like we're going to see, we're going to continue to see collapsing volatility. Um, I wouldn't expect this chart to do much. The real chart that I'm looking at, like like laser focused on um, during this mini bull market, or maybe it's a macro bull market, who knows? Um, but the reverse repos, as long as there is money to keep coming out of these reverse repos, I do believe that we should continue to see positive developments um, in crypto and in stocks. So as we've talked about for the past couple months, the direction is up. Um, we're bullish here. We're, we're looking for some kind of like change in the prevalent macro conditions for us to really um, come off that thesis. Um, at the same time, I'm still kind of, um, I'm still kind of looking for exits, um, lucrative exits on some of my shit coins and they've hit some better levels. Like um, Link, for example, has continued to go up. Um, I have come very close to considering taking profit, but I hadn't like, I don't have a lucrative enough, lucrative enough exit on that for me to justify um, selling it at the moment. So um, if I'm wrong and things crash, well, I'll just hold it through the crash, whatever. And I've got plenty of, um, of cash sitting on the sidelines to buy more degenerate plays if and when that opportunity comes. Gold uh, continues to just trend sideways here while everything else goes up. This is a common tactic. Um, gold is, what are you going to say? Like gold is going to trend sideways. Everything else is going to trend up. It's going to tend to push the focus off of gold. People are going to get tired, throw their gold bags away. And then when the opportunity is ripe, um, we're going to see a breakout of gold. I don't know when that's going to come. We've been talking about forever. This chart is very clearly going to break out and the direction of all assets is basically always up. So, but again, you'll notice this is a very long-term chart. This chart doesn't, excuse me, this chart doesn't actually come to an end until, um, until like after 2025 starts. And so it could still be some time. Gold is your stable coin, guys. Like gold is the coin that you get into um, that helps you to like keep your value in times of woe and want and bear markets. Um, we'll go to the bonds, which haven't done anything. This slightly looks, I can't decide if this looks like a short-term bottoming pattern, you know, where we're going to kind of keep going up or if this looks more like a, uh, a bearish flag, right? So I have no idea. It doesn't really matter. Um, we're just looking for the overall big, big picture trends to emerge. We're looking for this chart to make violent moves, um, to help us, um, understand that a macro change is a sea change is happening in the moment. Um, stocks made new all-time highs, right? NASDAQ. NASDAQ on uh, on Friday put on 1%, which, you know, for crypto, we're like whatever yawn, but for, for stocks, that's actually pretty high. And as we've talked about for a while, we very much, 
I expect this chart to continue going until we tag these um, these long term standard deviation <laughs> standard the standard deviation of the standard deviation really the the moving standard deviation of the moving standard deviation. I know that's a mouthful. Just to, just believe that <laughs> just believe me when I tell you that these are important lines here and that things are going to get up to this area before um, maybe some kind of big pullback uh, or who knows like maybe we could have a pullback now and then and then get up to those lines. But I mean we're the the direction is here like that's where this chart is going that's where the S and P is going um, that's where the Nasdaq is going. So um, we'll continue to re continue to remain bullish there especially because uh, reverse repos still have um, still have money to give that's half a trillion dollars sitting there. Um, the global liquidity hasn't really changed that much, still just kind of flat. So, um, but remember, uh, one of the things I think that I realized as of the past, maybe three or four weeks is that global liquidity and global risk assets play off of each other. So as liquidity goes up, um, that means that there's fresh money to put into stuff, which goes into the stock market. And as stocks get valued higher, that means that there's more backing for more liquidity, for fresh printing, for fresh loans to be made. And so they kind of play off of each other, which is why we've seen this kind of like staggered stair step between the two um, is, is something we've noticed there. Um, let's go quickly to crypto. Um, all right, let's go back to Bitcoin here and just look at the bigger chart. Um, yeah, I mean, Bitcoin's still hitting, still kind of flirting with this, um, you know, with that 50,000 level, really technically 48,000, not quite 50, but... Um, uh, really starting to get up here to the top side of this line. I don't know how much I trust that, but for the moment, you know, things feel good. It wouldn't surprise me if things have to cool off here for a little bit. I'm not saying, I'm not predicting that or anything. I'm just saying that, um, you know, it is, it is pretty high and I hate chasing. I really hate chasing. Um, I would, I would much rather get into something at what I think is a really great price and then ride that shit up for a long time than to try and chase something that I think I missed. I hate recommending that people buy something that's already gone up so much. Um, but that doesn't mean that you can't make gains there. And some people are trend traders. Um, I'm definitely not a trend trader. I'm a bottom and a top picker and people tell you not to do that, but it's so far working out. Okay. For me. Um, <laughs> let's see, this is Bitcoin dominance and still kind of sitting on the underside of this triangle. Um, I really, <laughs> I really don't want to see this end up back into this area. Cause that, that could mean big things for Bitcoin dominance. Um, and that's really, really not good for digital freedom money. Cause it's just a distraction. It doesn't get us anywhere. All of their fucking scaling solutions are going to take years for them to think of even possibly forking into the chain and then actually developing into something that's scalable. Like there's so much complexity and hoop jumping. It's, it's insane. Um, but now they have NFTs. So that really, really helps the demand for their chain. They've got NFTs and BRC twenties and all that shit. So like that, that's really helping them a lot. Um, so um, do, do, do. we'll take a look ETFs at the and then we'll call it a day. And NFTs, yeah, yeah, yeah. all that good stuff. They're getting all this three-letter stuff. Hmm. Yeah. <laughs> Seems like they're pretty good with the three-letter acronyms lately. NSA, Anyways. CIA. <laughs> uh, okay. Then the last one to look at here is total. You'll notice that total like hasn't actually fully touched the um, the long-term upper standard deviation lines that we set after the bull market. So uh, at this point, I basically do expect total to get up here into this area. Yeah, I just I just want to I just want to interrupt this. We got our first. I didn't even know this was a thing. We got our first Facebook love. Uh, for, <laughs> apparently we're streaming on Facebook too. I didn't even know. That's kind of funny. We're at, we almost hit a hundred live views. We're at ninety six right now. Like and share, guys. Let's 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 keep uh, getting the numbers up. Go ahead, body. Nice. Yeah. So um, yeah. So we got those ETFs. We got the inflows, as Anon not Anon Man is pointing out here. Um, but uh, yeah. So I kind of expect here at this point things are so um, things are so good. Uh, things are so bullish, and there's just liquidity and money. I do expect total to make it at least probably to the upper standard deviation level. This is not, again, guys, this is not um, a resistance line. This is not a hard capping resistance. Often things can do this, right? Come up here and then come back down, right? That's So I just want to help you guys understand this is, this is not hard resistance lines. They're zones of importance, right? They're areas that we need to focus on um, because market psychology is going to be focused on them. Oftentimes they can even act as pivot points. So if things really accelerate, like this could actually just be a pivot point that slams to the upside. It's rare, except unless you're the stock market, unless you're like supported by the cabal, it is very rare for an asset just to like from the bottom to make one fell swoop towards the top side here to your very long-term standard deviation, your upper standard deviation, hang out and then just pump, right? That's so rare for that to happen. What should happen typically like in, in a rational organic market would be something more along the lines like that. Um, so, uh, yeah, that's, um, that's what we're looking at today. Um, uh, you know, I didn't unfortunately pay enough attention to the body real quick. You want to go back to the XMR USD one day chart? 
Yes, I would like to. Look at that, guys. Our, our stable coin depegged. Oh, no. <laughs> <laughs> Finally, movement. Also, have you taken a look at the, the Melt Cow Phase law chart at all? No, I've, I don't. I have no idea what you're talking about. Oh, really? Uh, so it's on Monerage.net, and it's like this chart that compares Monero's fair price value compared to what it's currently valued at based on uh, transaction amounts and I think something else. How am I spelling this wrong? M-O-N-E-R-O-J.net. Oh, yeah, I think... Um... Oh. Oh, you got to go to... Oh, here, I'll send you the direct link in the private chat. It's on, like, a subdirectory of the, the site. Oh, okay. Yeah, that's probably faster. Moniraj. I've never heard of that. What is this? This is a Monero uh, price, like a fair value price chart. Oh, okay. Is that like taking into account um, stock to flow and all that? Uh, I'm not sure all of what it's taking into account. Um, I think it's mostly based on transaction amounts. Uh, uh, okay. It looks like your screen is frozen. Um. Oh, you sent it in the other. I was looking on uh, on Telegram. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. Yeah, I sent it in the private chat. Uh, yeah, okay. I'm, I've been on this site a number of times. I do like their charts. I do like the, the things that they put out here. It's pretty cool. Um, yeah, funny enough that the price oh, yes. diverged um, right about the time Good that Binance Monero... listed it, right? Yep. yep. Very sus. That's pretty ironic. Wait, wait. Explain this. What are, what are we looking at here? So this is Metcalf's law. It basically it theorizes that the value of your network is proportional to the um, to the number of Not transactions. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, to the number of users, to the number of specifically, I think they're looking at transactions per day here. Um, awesome. And maybe that's like a I, I think it's like number of transactions squared is what that equation is supposed to be. So I'm trusting that the dude that made this um, or gal that made this site, um, you know, has got it, has got Metcalf's law correctly, and that equation correctly pumped into this, but. Um, yeah, this is like kind of like we would expect to be higher up here if um, if Monero was traded in at least at a similar fashion in the way that Bitcoin and other coins trade on the basis of their transaction counts. You know, speaking of transaction counts, let's take a look at that. Um, yeah, yeah. So yeah, the yeah. day, take a look at that. the day that um, that the the blessing from Binance happened, um, we shot up to almost 30,000 transactions. So really a lot less than you might have thought. I really would have thought more people. I was kind of expecting more like 35,000 um, 35, transactions or higher. Um, yeah, and then it's kind of come back down. So a lot of people selling, a lot of people buying, trying to make moves and whatnot. Uh, and yes, Esteban, I think that that is where Binance started um, fractionally reserving Monero. And a fractional reserve, so selling an asset that you don't actually have amounts to a naked short. You owe a promise of something that you don't have, and you're going to have to eventually purchase that. Um, or if you're Binance, find other shady ways of getting around it. I think they, I think their Monero miners probably covered for quite a lot. It was weird last year when they mysteriously stopped shutting down withdrawals. Um, so maybe they knew from a long way off that they were going to do this delisting. Um, you know, here's another, here's another thought. Remember in 2021 when Bittrex delisted Monero, and um, that was used to hit the price as everything else pumps. Man. I feel like that's that that rhymes a lot with what's happening here. Uh, it seems to me like there's still more pump to happen in the markets. I don't think this is necessarily like the pump to break all time highs for for Bitcoin and other stuff, but it does seem like like quite the move is being made here, and it's it's been sustained for a long time. So it does seem well timed, right? To to put that news out there, D-list uh, D-list Monero, um, especially you know when their fractional reserve scheme that they used to suppress price last time maybe ran out of steam. Um, I am curious again if they can roll this same scheme into other into other exchanges, and I am curious what the liquidity situation looks like across across the markets. Um, it is friction getting from getting into Monero outside of an instant swap, except for like local Monero um, and Bisc. Like there's there's just friction to get from the coins you want to get from into Monero or Monero into the other coins. Um, like like for example, let's suppose I wanted to get from USDC. There's no USDC on local Monero. Um, at least I didn't see it on, uh, you know, on, on, as an option. So, um, 
I don't know, maybe I need to go be the liquidity that I want to see in the world and hit up the local Monero guys and say, hey, can we expand the coin offerings here? I think that would be a pretty good deal, um, especially stable coins. Because uh, I mean, I, you know, I do like to hedge, hedge my position. Sometimes I do like to say, okay, well, I, you know, I, I don't want to lose my value here, right? I'm going to, I'm going to stable coin. I'm going to tether. Um, so uh, anyways, yeah, like there, there's friction. Um, I want to see like really ideally what I want to see is Ethereum, XMR, swaps, gain liquidity. Um, maybe that'll never happen. Maybe no one's interested in XMR ETH liquidity, but to me, that's the most useful liquidity because inside of Ethereum, I can get into wrapped Bitcoin. If I want exposure to Bitcoin price, I can get an exposure to Bitcoin price and I can do it trustlessly. Um, and it's very unlikely that those guys are just going to rug pull after like six or seven years. I guess they could, uh, I should look into more who, like who has the wrapped Bitcoin. I think they're a corporate entity. Um, anyways, Ethereum just has all, like all kinds of stuff that you can get into and out of and that's stable coins and that's like crazy other tokens and degeneracy and NFTs and wrapped Bitcoin. And it would be nice just to get some some liquidity um, in atomic swaps between Monero and Ethereum. Um, that's like high up on my project list to do here at some point <laughs> to to go maybe offer some of that liquidity. So anyways, um, yeah, guys, I guess that's about all I got for you today. Unless, um, good unless stuff, you wanted to man. take a good look stuff. at more of, more of the charts. No, I, I, I think that's good, and we we have a big show ahead. I had uh, the basic swap guys on last night. I recorded a show with them. Um, that's you know an, another another good avenue to to obtain Monero anonymously uh, via atomic swaps through basic swap. It's pretty impressive what they've done over there. Um, they're basic saying swap that the, dot. Uh, basic swap. I don't I don't know the. Uh, You've heard of them, right? The, we've, we've had, we had them at Monerotopia. They presented. That's the particle project that built Basic Swap. Oh, okay. Decentralized exchange. It's got atomic swaps built into it. There's no, there's no trickery there with using particle coin. It's its own true uh, decentralized exchange. You gotta, you know, di download the client. You run, you you run it, and then you can do uh, a swap in a pretty seamless way from Monero to Bitcoin or Litecoin. They have a couple of other coins on there, Firo. Uh, but they were saying like Litecoin is is probably the, the you know, what they recommend people use now for purposes of trying to get into Monero through basic swap. So go hmm. obtain your like, you know, if, if you need to go obtain your Litecoin on a centralized exchange, uh, super cheap to send and super fast and easy to then swap into Monero anonymously on basic swap peer to peer. You know, it's not it's not an instant exchange. It's a true peer to peer atomic based swap exchange. So nice. OK, yeah, and it, it exists. You know, this is this isn't theoretical. We're not we're not waiting for it to 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 launch. Uh, it's been up and running and they've been iterating and improving. So it's it's happening, guys. It's not uh, it's not theoretical. We, we've been delisted and the the solutions around it already exist and are now just need to improve in terms of their usability and adoption. I love it. Like there's so many different options out there, like it's hard to keep track of them all. Yeah, that's that, that's a good sign, right? There's there's competition in wanting to be the, you know, be the bridge to Monero in a decentralized way, um, which is great to see. Well, I will go check them out then. Hopefully they have a hidden service. Have a what? Hidden service? Yeah, like Tor. Uh yeah, I'm sure you could you could do it that way. Yeah. I don't see like, why. For example, local to... Monero has an onion address, so you can go directly to their onion address and mm -hmm. um, use it as a hidden service. Right. It's just more private. Anytime you have to exit the Tor network to get to a website, um, to get to a clear net website, you're you're like there's privacy risks there, significant ones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, with basic swap, you have to run, you know, you have to download and run the client, you know, run a client, a basic swap oh. node. Yeah. Right. I'm so not sure if the client would better. perform well through uh, Tor. I don't know. Yeah, but at that point, I like you really, do you, is it, is it, do you need a Tor connection for, I mean, obviously it would be ideal, but you're, I don't know, from an OPSEC perspective. I mean, yeah, you're uh, still making connection to the, to a server in the same way that you would be with, uh, or like other parties in the same way mm -hmm. it would be with the website, but. And I, I don't see why you wouldn't be able to do that through tour. I guess, like you said, just for, for, for speed or whatnot, but I, I don't know. I think it might actually be, I, I didn't bring that up to them. Usually Question. you can tourify just about anything by sending it yeah. through a gateway. Um, 
for the most part. Not not everything. Yeah. 